Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Hello, my name is Lou White, and I'm glad you're here. And I'm, for those that are watching, I've got a screen up here to help with the text. Sorry about all the noise. Anyway, I've, we've installed a light here so you can see me a little bit better from the previous ones. We couldn't see me. I was just this dark, shadowy figure. <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Some of you came from a long way and for a very short little seminar. But the study today is, what is the gospel? Now, we're going to look at the word gospel, find out what it means. But I want to mention this. I was uh, w awakened in the middle of the night last night to kind of add this addendum or whatever, or preface. And that is this. Uh, over the period of time that we men have been on the earth, men and women, we've got um, basically a two-dimensional view of things. And... Um, like the Greeks and the Romans believed that the uh, earth was flat. They really believed it. But the Israelites, the tribes of Israel, knew that wasn't true. And they navigated the oceans. They sailed on the roads of the oceans, the channels, the currents. And they went far and wide. They had colonies all over in the United States before the United States was here, the North America, South America. The word Brazil is Hebrew. It means iron. That's where they mined iron. And they mined copper up in Michigan. And they found, we found a, a stone knife under, under some mounds in Tennessee that has For Yehuda written on it. Um, they didn't even know what it was. They just saw this writing. They didn't know the Native Americans could read and write. And they, they apparently could because they were the, the tribes of Israel. Well, those peoples, um, they knew, th these Israelites knew that the earth was round. Well, in, in the same kind of way, uh, Herodotus, which is the father of modern history, lived in the 5th century BCE. And he believed that the earth was flat. As smart as he was, he believed the earth was flat because that's what his culture taught him. And this wise man mentioned these peoples called the Phoenicians. Now, Phoenician is phoniki in Greek, and it means date palm. And he gets this word that he just invented, and he calls these peoples that are suddenly uh, discovered all over the earth uh, Phoenicians, which is a Greek term. They didn't call themselves Phoenicians. But we know that they were Israelites. But mo modern historians still don't know who they are. They just say they have this strange alphabet. And the Israelites stole this alphabet from them. Well, it's because they were the Israelites. You see? These kinds of obvious things and these connections are going to be made today in other ways re relative to what the message of the kingdom of Yahuwah is. Because we've been looking at this thing for 2,000 years, this message, in the wrong way. Because we've been keeping it a two-dimensional object, like a flat earth. There's three dimensions. There's another dimension to some of the words. The word belief or trust is actually from a Hebrew word, imuna, which actually is what we're supposed to be living by. The prophet Habakkuk said that we would live by our imuna, which is steadfastness and fidelity and faithfulness. It isn't, now the word faith that we've been translated and when we read our, our translations, we see the word faith, that we're justified by faith. The Hebrew word faith is imuna, and it actually is the key to understanding this third dimension. Because we're not just believing something like the Greeks believed, it was a thought process. But the Hebrew mindset of belief is believe and obey. That's why the 
the brother, the half-brother of Yahushua, Yaakov or James, had to go into great detail to show that faith without works is dead. Because people were thinking all you had to do was believe something in your mind. But you have to obey, which perfects it. You know, now that's the key to this whole thing. Because uh, that's why we had the pastoral advisory there. Now, uh, we're announcing actually the coming society that's going to be ruled by the creator of the universe, and we want to know what we want to put on this billboard. What is the real gospel? Because we've been living by a two-dimensional gospel for 2,000 years. So it is the message or report, which is in the Hebrew, it actually means fresh. That's what the literal word means. And it's the word basar, which, or b basora. And that Hebrew word means fresh or refreshing. And it is about the reign of Yahuwah and his covenant. And it's going to be real bad news for those who have rejected the covenant. Because, you know, the fear of Yahuwah, the, 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 actually, Yahuwah is with those who fear him. And he reveals his covenant to them. If you fear him, he will, he will reveal his covenant to them. Now, that's the ten words or the... Asarath Hadabarim, the Ten Commandments. That covenant is a covenant of love. It's how you love him and love your neighbor. So it's about love. It's not about hate. It's about love. Now the terminology that we're going to use today, some of you may not be familiar with the intricacies of it. We've got a traditional term over here and an authentic Hebrew term over here. The term L-O-R-D is inaccurate because it's not in the scriptures. It's a replacement word for the name written in Hebrew, yod Hey uah Hey, Yahuwah. So wherever the text translates, we're going to use his actual name. And that is, uh, to a lot of the ancient Yahudim that came out of Babylon, that is a blasphemy to say it aloud. But that's just a man-made thing, you know. He wants his name proclaimed. Now this term, J-E-S-U-S, -S, in Hebrew is Jesus, which would mean the horse. That's not what we're going to use. That's something very recent. That's uh, not even 500 years old. Isu is, a, is one of the terms that they use in the Greek. But uh, his real name in the Hebrew is yod he ua shin ayin which is Yahusha. Very similar spelling to the name of the creator of the universe. And it means Yah is our deliverer. We're going to avoid the word Christos and Christian and the word Cretan. If you look up the word Cretan on your, in your own time, just look it up. It comes from the word Christianos. It just went through another path. We're going to use the Hebrew word Mashiach. And we can probably use the word Messiah. That's actually slightly corrupted by the Greek because they don't have the SH sound. But Mashiach is the original term. And it means anointed one. And we're going to avoid this word G-O-D because that's actually not a good thing. It's a, we're going to look at that. I've got a, a whole frame that explains the encyclopedic source of the word G-O-D. It's a pagan uh, term for the, for the sun. We're going to use the term El or Elohim. Uh, Jews is really the tribe Yehuda. It's one tribe, and that's the royal tribe. That's where all the kings of Israel come from. The firstborn tribe would be another tribe. Reuben was originally the firstborn tribe, but the blessing went on Ephraim. Now, the term Yahudim means worshipers or praisers of Yah. Now, the term Yisrael is most accurately ascribed to all the tribes who descend from the man, Yaakob, whose name was changed to Yisrael most of whom are unaware of their identity in, in, the, in the present day. And the word Torah, we're going to use the word Torah a lot. And that is a Hebrew word for instruction. Toroth is the Hebrew for the instructions, plural. But Torah it means instruction. And it also refers to not just the five books of Moshe, but also to the covenant too, the covenant itself. His, Yahuwah's instructions for our living. Now, let's get in here real quick. Now, Yahushua gave us a message of et what eternal life was. He told the rich young man that came to him, how might I acquire everlasting life? And he said, if you seek to enter life,
keep the commandments. Well, that's why we have a Torah warning on this thing. This is, uh, this is the truth. How to know Yahuwah and Yahusha is by, the, uh, it's recorded in the, in the book of John or Yahukun in chapter 17. This is the high priestly prayer. This is the part where he mentions this. And this is everlasting life, that they should know you, the only true Elohim, and Yahushua HaMashiach, whom you have sent. Now, knowing Yahuwah without living in his covenant is not possible. You don't really know him. That's why he says, depart from me because I never knew you. You see? Now, if you live in his covenant, then that proves that you love him. Now, it's le they call it legalism, okay? But it's better to be legal than Ill Ill illegal. Now, if you miss this, you've missed it all. Love one another. That's one of the commandments that Yahuwah gave us. A renewed command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men, uh, shall all know that you are my taught ones if you have love for one another. And that the covenant teaches us the way of love. We're going to read the covenant while we're here and we're going to look at it and look at it from the perspective of love. Not meanness. Now the message of deliverance is about a person also because that person is the living Torah. Like we're living stones, that's a metaphor. Well, he's the living Torah. You know, so he's walking and talking when he was here in a body, and he was actually love come to life. The covenant was walking the earth. And we do too, because we have the covenant written in our hearts. Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be saved. He's quoting the prophet Yael. They call Joel. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Now you see, call is the Hebrew word kara, and it means to proclaim something. You have to utter it, preach it, speak it out loud. How shall they hear without one proclaiming? And how shall they proclaim if they are not sent? Who will go for us? You know, that was the question that Yahuwah asked the prophet Yeshayahu, or Isaiah. As it has been written, how pleasant are the feet of those who bring the good news of peace, who bring the good news of the good. However, not all obeyed the good news. So you have to obey the good news. That's interesting. Because the good news, or the gospel, or the besora in the Hebrew, the message, if you believe the message, then you have to obey the message. For Yeshiyahu, that's Yesh Isaiah, says, Yahuwah, who has believed our report? Our report. So then belief comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Elohim. That would be his covenant. If you haven't heard his covenant, then you haven't heard the, the good news. And I ask, did they not hear? Yea, indeed, their voice went out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. And I ask, did Yisrael not know? First, Moshe says, I shall provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, I shall enrage you by an unwise nation. And that was a prophecy from Deuteronomy 32 because Yahuwah knew that the Israelites were going to be scattered into the nations and they would return to the Torah. Yahuwah proved his love by laying our guilt on his son. Now that's a very important point to remember because we're redeemed not by our own works but by our, his blood. But because of that, his life is what, is what comes into us and enables us to love his covenant. And he writes it on our hearts. Romans 5 says, But Elohim proves his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Messiah died for us. Now that's works. He really did a lot of work. That was hard work. So if he, if he just believed it, that would be not enough. Because, but he had to do something about it. Much more than ha having been declared right by his blood, we have been saved from wrath through him. For if being enemies we were restored to favor with Elohim through the death of his son, much more having been restored to favor, we shall be saved by his life. Because he's not dead. He died, but he's now he's living in us. He's walking around on the earth through his people.
and he's going to come back. Now, can belief alone save? That's a good question. Belief alone. Just the, the Greek mindset was belief is a thought process. It doesn't involve action. The Hebrew mindset, belief involves both thought and action, and the action perfects the belief, and it would be incomplete without the action, the actual obeying of the, what you believe. So your belief actually proves that of what, what you believe. It, I mean, your, your, uh, your actions are evidence to the world of what you believe. Righteousness, by faith or works. Now, we mentioned the word imuna. It's the Hebrew word 530. And it means fidelity, faithfulness, steadfastness, firmness, and stability. Now, that's what was translated into the word faith. People don't know that. That's why we're, we're, we've been living for 2,000 years in a two-dimensional understanding of this. There's a three-dimensional thing going on here because we have to expand this to understand it as the Hebrew mind understands it. The Greek mind, it's only thought. The Hebrew mind involves thought and action. Now, in the, his, his half-brother James, or Yaakov, said, my, this is another Yaakov, by the way, you know, not the one that was named Israel, but uh, he says, my brothers, what use is it for anyone to say that he has belief but does not have works? This belief is unable to save him. So also belief, if it does not have works in itself, is in itself dead. But someone might say, you have belief and I have works. Show me your belief without your works, and I shall show you my belief by my works. That means by means of my works. So what they're doing actually is the evidence of their faith or their belief. So obedience to commandments is commonly attacked by this one word maxim. A maxim is a, is a word or a phrase that is said over and over and over again to program you. It could be for good or bad, but in this case it's not good. Because the word legalism has a bad connotation now. But actually, being legal is excellent, you know, because you don't want to be accused of being illegal, you know. Anyway, our obedience is evidence of our faith showing the difference between the Greek and the Hebrew understanding of belief. Now, faith and works actually work together, and James, or Yaakov, is going to illustrate that from how that worked out with Abraham. But you, but do you wish to know, O foolish man, that the belief without the works is dead? Was not Abraham our father declared right by works when he offered Yishak his son on the, on the altar? Do you see that the belief was working with his, work, his works? And by the works, the belief was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed Elohim, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Now, when a Greek mind reads that, they only see thought processes. But what that text really means to the Hebrew reader is that this is actually both things. It's both. So get out of the two-dimensional world and stop being a flat earther and uh, be, a, be amazed at the fact that there's three dimensions. You, I mean, you can get out into the, the spherical realm here. Um, so you, you see the word believed, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness, it includes the works. As he was called Elohim's friend, you see then that a man is declared right by works and not by belief alone. And so the word believed in the Hebrew mind includes obedience, not simply thought. And the obedience proves our love. In Exodus or Shemoth 20, it says, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Now, that, those two go hand in hand. If you don't love him, you're not going to guard his commandments. That word guard means shamar. And it means, it's the Hebrew word shamar. And it means to watch over very carefully. You know. Now, in 1 Yehuchanan, or 1 John 3, Yehusha himself was talking to Nicodemus, remember? And he says, and whatever we ask, we receive. No, this isn't. He wasn't talking to Nicodemus. I was, I'm sorry. I was in another place there. This is where our disciple whom Yehusha loved was saying this. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we guard his commands. That's what, what it says. We guard his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. 
And this is his command, that we should believe in the name of his son, Yahushua Messiah, and love one another as he gave us command. And the one guarding his commands stays in him and he in him. And by this we know that he stays in us by the spirit which he gave us. And Yahushua said in Yahukanan 14 or John 14, if you love me, you shall guard my commands. He's not speaking anything differently. He's on the topic. He never left it. The same thing that said in the Tanakh. And I shall ask the Father, and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever, the spirit of the truth, whom the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, for he stays with you and shall be in you. He stays with you means that he's right here with you now because he's the one doing the talking. That's Yahushua. That's the spirit. The spirit, he's saying, I'm going to be with you. I am with you, but I'm going to be in you. That's what he's saying right there. Uh, those who are, that are recording this, uh, I mean, viewing this on the DVD, can read that and see, and see what it says. Acts 5, 32 says, And we are his witnesses to these matters, and so also is the set-apart spirit whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. Now that includes belief, of course. That people don't obey if they don't believe. The helper is Yahushua's spirit in us, enable us to perceive our walk from his perspective. Now, we perceive our walk in the flesh without his mindset, and we do what we want, and we think the commandments are keeping us from having fun. But in fact, when we see, when he comes into us, he gives us his perspective, and then we see sin for what it really is. Sin is transgression of the commandments, and we don't want anything to do with it. Belief is perfected by obedience. First Yehuchanan 2 says, and he himself is an atoning offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for all the world. And by this, we know that we know him, if we guard his commands. The one who says, I know him, but does not guard his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever guards his word, that's the commandments, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who stays, who says he stays in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So he wouldn't walk differently than Yahushua walked. There's that pastoral advisory down there, so watch out. Now, Acts 3, we have uh, a, a very interesting thing just before uh, Kepha and Peter, or Peter was arrested with several others. Uh, he's talking to the crowds of Israelites that were visiting it on the fe Feast of Shabuoth. And he says, repent, therefore, and turn back for the blotting out of your sins in order that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Master. In other words, he's not present with them right now, but he's going, he's going to have to be somewhere else. And he's saying, in order that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Master, and that he sends Yahushua Messiah pre-appointed for you, whom heaven, or Shamayim, needs to receive until the times of restoration of all matters, of which Elohim spoke through the mouth of all his set-apart prophets of old. In other words, Yahushua is going to return when the restoration is completed. This is a restoration too. Part of these words that we're using are restoring the dimension Belief is not just thought, it's action. That's part of the restoration. A very important part of it, as a matter of fact. Restoring the name is another. After we're restored, then we'll be delivered. See, we're not delivered yet. So he's going to be staying away until this work that he's doing in the world is done. Now, in Romans 10, we, we can't ignore the message without going to Romans. Romans is just dripping with the message. But in chapter 10, it says, Truly, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for Israel is for deliverance. For I bear them witness that they have an ardor for Elohim, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing the righteousness of Elohim and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of Elohim. Now, the righteousness of Elohim is, once again, Torah. It's the instructions. How long will you put off obeying my commandments? He, kept, he keeps saying it over and over. He never stops. 
Deliverance will result for those living according to the righteousness of Elohim. But what is the righteousness of Elohim? Well, let's look at it. Now, restoring the lost tribes of Israel to their Hebraic roots is essential. You've got to understand what the Hebrew words are to really understand the content. Are you pursuing righteousness? Now, if we shine the light of Yahuwah's word on, on everything that's taught and test every teaching to be certain that we're in the pattern of living, the living way, the living words are the covenant. See, Stephen was basically stoned for that. You know, when, when he looked up and he, he was in front of the Sanhedrin and Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and he said, uh, he was explaining to the leaders of Israel, the elders of Israel, about the living words that were given to them at Sinai. They're living words. That's the living water. That's the water that if a man drinks of it, he'll never thirst. Okay? Is the gospel Torah? Is that possible? Is the message, the Besora, is, the, is, is it Torah? Is the Torah righteousness? Yes, it is. Well, can we be saved by belief in Mashiach and not obey the Torah? Can we have a religion, which is a, a man-made thing, uh, can we have a religion about the Messiah that doesn't involve the Torah? We do. We have one. Not us, but that's what many of us came up through, and we overcame it. Well, now, I want to mention this. In Hawaii, they have a motto for the state. The state motto is ua me ke ia o kaina i kapono. That sounds kind of Hebrew. And I think they're Hebrews, <laughs> lost tribes. The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Now, the word for righteousness in Hebrew is sedek. Sedeka. And it is defined as being right, lawful, just, ethical, and upright. What is righteousness? Well, that's what it is. Righteousness is these things. Now, can you be any of these things without obeying the Torah, the, co the covenant? No, you can't. Because it's Yahuwah's desire for us. Now, his perfect will is that we obey his covenant. That's his perfect will. Romans 12 says, I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion, compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Now, you have to remember, too, our heart is our inner lamp our body on the outside, you can't see a person's heart. That's their spiritual component. And that's where everything comes out of. And then you see the person either speaking a certain way out of their heart. The good and the bad both come. Now, here is Yahuwah's desire for us, how we renew or program our mind. He's walking, wanting us to renew our mind. Now, if we're not using, if, if we're not using this next frame to renew our mind with, then it's because we have no light in us. To the Torah and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light. This is a retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes of Israel in the last days. And he said this was for the lost tribes. He said you would be scattered, just like Ezekiel explains. You will be scattered abroad into the nations and live among people who worship falsely, just like the prodigal son. Given at Deuteronomy 5, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast... The Hebrew word is nasa, which means to throw. The name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, 
which is the word Shoah, which means to destroy utterly, like Yom HaShoah, the day of the Holocaust. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. To not use it? Uh-oh. Restoring the lost tribes continues here in the last days. Number four. Now the Christians adhere to the pagan Sabbath, the one that Yahuwah did not bless. The seventh day was blessed. The blessing hasn't been shifted. But here is the commandment. Guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and you shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. It's not the Jewish Sabbath. It's everybody's, everybody's task to obey it. It's his Sabbath. It's the seventh day as a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now don't miss that one. Because that's the sign of the everlasting covenant. That's the evidence given in uh, Exodus, uh, and uh, I believe it's uh, Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter 20. So if you want to check that. Now, number five is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged, and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Now these commandments, in some cases, are just two words, you know. Um, number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now the Catholics, uh, they switched this, they did away with the second commandment about bowing to idols. And they made the tenth one into two, so that they'd re remain, have ten. Here, O Yisrael, now we haven't broken stride here, this is just continuing straight through. Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one, and you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. How do you love him? Well, his, he said, obey my commandments. And these words, he just finished speaking, or, you know, reciting, through which, uh, th no, these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. They're to be in your heart. You shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, as frontlets. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house, and on your gates. That's Deuteronomy 6. See, we just, we've been going through Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 6, without a break. This is for the last days. Break loose, annul, dissolve, destroy. Now, this is part of the word problem that we have in understanding the Hebrew understandings. In Matthew 5, Yahushua illustrates something about breaking or annulling something. Whoever then breaks one, just one, of, these, of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. Now, the word uh, break, okay, is the word, um, let's see, it's uh, lui, or no, luo, luo, in the Greek. But the, the idea of breaking is from the binding and the loosing of something. If you uh, bind something in, in, a, in a commandment way, it means that the Torah forbids it. It's forbidden. So if somebody says, is it okay to do this? If you go to a person that's a teacher that knows Torah, and he says, uh, no, you can't do that. That's against Torah. Then he's bounded. 
But if he permits it, then he, you know, it's loosed. So loosing, if you loose something, that, that's where the word break means. It means to loose or annul or to do away with a commandment. So do, if you do away with one, then you've done it. Now, alteration is not encouraged, in other words. He's not saying, let's just alter it however we like. Or let's get a committee and we'll all decide and whatever the committee says. See, that's where Catholicism went astray. They thought that they had authority in themselves to change whatever they wanted and then everything would be just fine. Now, here's a, a question again. Did Yahushua's death and resurrection change the Sabbath day? Now, that's what Christianity has been taught. Hebrews 4 says, so there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Elohim. For the one, having entered into his rest, has himself also rested from his, his works as Elohim rested from his own. So he's referring back to creation week here, see? Now, how did Elohim rest from his own? On the seventh day of the week. Nothing's changed. Now, we're to imitate that. Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into that rest, because that's what the word Sabbath really means, to rest, to cease. To stop. Lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For the word of Elohim, that's the Torah, we've just read it, the commandments, is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirit and of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's the inner self, the heart, the lamp the lamp that we put the covenant into. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom is our account. He can see into us and see our inner thoughts. And he knows what we're thinking and he knows our motives. Now translators have misunderstood some things. In Romans 10, we're going to see something real, really interesting here. It's about the word goal. Uh, they translated this in some translations as an ending, like this is a termination of Torah. And we just heard that we can't do that. We can't alter it. Now, Romans 10 says, Truly, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for Israel is for deliverance. For I bear them witness that they have an ardor for Elohim, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing the righteousness of Elohim and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of Elohim. For Messiah is the goal of the Torah unto righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moshe writes about the righteousness which is of the Torah. The man who does these shall live by them. Man's attempt to establish his own righteousness is known as religion. Now belief in Yahusha, if we believe, can we ignore the Torah? Well, that would be a, a fear of Torah, wouldn't it? Uh, hear no Torah, see no Torah, speak no Torah, be Torah-phobic. But we're we're, we are redeemed by the blood of Yahushua to walk after the Spirit in obedience, we're not just uh, belief. You know. Now, Romans 3.31 says, Do we then nullify the Torah through the belief? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. Now, Shaul's writings are difficult. You can read 2 Peter 3, 15 through 18, where it explains that. It says, um, you then, beloved ones, having been forewarned, watch, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, that's imuna, faith, faithfulness, being led away with the de delusion of the lawless. So that's just the opposite of legalism. He wants us to be legal. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is is life and peace. In other words, when you think about things from the fleshly mind, then it's, it's ultimately going to lead you to death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is hatred or enmity towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able, and those who are in the mind of the flesh are unable to please Elohim. So if you're not interested in the Torah of Elohim, you're going to wind up dead. Not just your flesh, your spirit. Uh, so mind of means controlled by. In other words, the mind is the inner self that, that actually motivates you. Uh, there's Al Gore again. I always like to get him in. 
He's asking a question, does your flesh run your life? Mind refers to our inner lamp, which is our heart, because we're body and we're spirit. Our commission, now that's a co-mission. A mission is a, is a, is a you know, something we're sent to do into the world. Now a co-mission means that we're all together doing the same mission, you know, if we're doing it together. That's what co means. Now, it's a delegated, ordained marching order, is what it is. We're all told to do this. Now, I believe that this, above most of the other places in Scripture, although there are many references to it in other ways, this is the core of the message. And this is, this is one that we overlook because of distractions. Yahushua is rising up, about to rise up into the air, and he's talking to his Nazarim. He's not talking to his C-H-U-R-C-H. He's talking to his kahal, his called out ones, his Nazarim. Those are his followers, the sect of the Nazarim, the branches. You know, the guardians of the covenant in his name. Those, two, those people are hearing him say this. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the set-apart spirit. Now that's where they get distracted because they want you to look at three things here. It's really one thing, it's the name. But here's where the, the rubber reach, meets the road for the message. Teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. Israelites, not serene Israelites. And see I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. Now that's really the core of it. We're supposed to teach them to guard all that I have commanded you. Now, he wasn't a Christian. Yahushua's not a Christian. He's not the one that founded Christianity. That was founded by the Catechetical School of Alexandria, basically in the year 190, with the C-H-U-R-C-H fathers, Pantanus, Clement, Origen, Epiphanius, all those guys over three or four centuries. That's where Christianity started. I'm not trying to be hateful about that. It's just the truth. He is the, the high priest of Israel. Now, find learners who will hear you, teaching them. You've got you to go somewhere to teach these people. So you're supposed to find the, laner, the learners and teach them the name and teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. Okay, that's not complicated. But people have missed it because they've just been so you know, two-dimensional that they haven't been able to figure out that, hey, the word believe means to obey. So we're not teaching anybody to obey. We're going to teach them not to. <laughs> that's just wrong. Was that Columbo in that picture? Everybody see Columbo? Anyway, the Nazarene guard his word and his name. That's what, we're, that's what we guard. The word Nazarene means branches branches as an offspring of his teachings and we are also guardians that's what the word means also guardians are watchers watchmen now the the guardians are guarding his name and his covenant and oh we've been hated by the CHURCH fathers the uh, the catechetical school of Alexandria is on record saying that we don't uh, accept them because they don't accept us either, but not because of that, but because we live as the Yahudim live. We, we eat kosher, we keep the commandments, we rest on the seventh day Sabbath. We don't have anything to do with the fathers, you know, the C-H-U-R-C-H fathers. Uh, they actually recorded that. And, and they know that we were called Nazarim. All the way back into the second century, that's where the record goes, that the Nazarim, who were the descendants of the teachings of Yahushua, that they hated and they called us heretics because we keep the commandments and we don't subject ourselves to their authority and their teachings. Now, in Psalm 138, 2, it says, I bow myself toward your set-apart heckel, that's temple, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great your word, your name, above all. So the covenant is, is his word, that he's made with us. There's only one covenant. That's the relationship. It's a, it's a love relationship. It's actually a marriage. And we are guardians of the name and we're guardians of the word, which is the Torah. 
Now, here's an announcement that Yahushua made when he first started in his work. It's recorded at Luke 4, and he's quoting a prophet, Yeshayahu, they call Isaiah in 61, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And according to his practice, he went into the congregation, that's the group meeting on the Sabbath, <clears throat> and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu was handed to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahuwah is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring the basar, the good news, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to release them that are crushed, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahuwah. And having rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the congregation were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today, today this scripture has been filled in your hearing. Now that word he used there was, of course, basar. And it was, you know, basora, the message. Now the message included a lot of things. But it, it, one of the things I want you to notice that it says, release to them that are crushed. That's important because we're going to deal with some of that. That's a broken-hearted thing. He sent me to heal the broken-hearted. Now, the reason the message is unknown is, is a secret, because parables were used. Okay? It's a secret. It's not open for everybody to understand. You have to have his spirit to even understand it. Now, Matthew 13, 34 and 35 says, Yahushua said all this to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable, so that what was spoken by the prophet might be filled, saying, I shall open my mouth in parables. I shall pour forth what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. And the parable still concealed the message from those that were not given their secret meaning. So there is a secret. And, this, and part of the secret is, you know, it, it is the covenant. The covenant itself. That's what re was rejected by the catechetical school of Alexandria. When you, when you hear about the school of Alexandria, you hear about a lot of allegorizing and spiritualizing and all that stuff, you know. And he doesn't really want you to literally obey. He just wants you to believe because they're Greeks. You know, I know they were in Egypt, but they were Greeks, you know. The, the Greek Empire. Now, it says here, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Of, I don't know how many I have, but this is a really good one. Psalm 25, 14, the secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. Huh? He must, this man here in this picture is reading a piece of paper, and he's forcing his eyes open. Remember the Sabbath to keep it set apart. He must force his eyes to open to something he was blinded from, from ever seeing before. But this man has discovered one of the clues to solving the secret message. The fact that he'd been taught lies. Now, Yeshayahu 61 also continues, and it says, For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the seed to shoot up, so the Master Yahuwah causes righteousness and praise to shoot up before all the nations. The seed is the Torah. That's what it is. The covenant is the seed that produces the fruit. And here's the, some fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. A little bit different from the Inquisition, you know? It's a little bit different. Galatians 5.22 is where that's recorded. It's, it's called the fruits of the Spirit. Now, in Galatians 5, it says, you were running well. Who held you back from obeying the truth? Because the truth is another code word for the Torah. The covenant. Now, there is a message in Mark 16, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the message, the good news, to every creature. He who has believed and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who has not believed shall be condemned. Now, believed includes the word, uh, the idea of obedience. Just to believe is not enough. It is a message to be believed and obeyed. So we have to love one another, and the only way we can love one another is if we're in the covenant, because we can't have fellowship without the covenant with him or a, a, one another. Uh, Yahushua used the word basora in the, in the, 
prophet Yeshiyahu 61. Not the word gospel, because that word we're going to look at in just a moment. He wasn't speaking Greek or Japanese or any of those things. Um, here is one of the things that he said uh, from that time in Matthew in Matthew chapter four. It says, and from that and from that time, Yahushua began to proclaim and say, "This is also the message: Repent, for the reign of the heavens has drawn near." Now, repentance means to turn back. It's a spiritual thing you wouldn't understand unless you think spiritually. And he's talking to Nicodemus here. Um, if you do not believe when I spoke to you about earthly matters, how are you going to believe when I speak to you about the heavenly matters? And no one has gone up into the heaven except he who came down from the heaven, the son of Adam. And as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of Adam has to be lifted up so that whoever is believing in him should not perish, but possess everlasting life. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but possess everlasting life. For Elohim did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He sent his son into the world to atone. When he comes back to redeem us, He's going to be a lion. And it'll be really, really fiery. He who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only brought forth son of Elohim. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their works were wicked. The light is the Torah and he is the walking, talking, living Torah. And when he brings his life into us, then we become just like him. We, we have that same attitude towards sin or breaking of the covenant. For everyone who is practicing evil hates the light, that's the Torah, lest his work should be exposed. But the one doing the truth, that's the Torah, comes to the light, that's the Torah, so that his works, that's his behavior, are clearly seen that they have been wrought in Elohim. The word of Yahuwah is the covenant. Now Stephen's declaration of the name brought forth some hostility. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, I referred to that a little earlier, uh, starting in chapter 55, uh, 7 verse 55, but he being filled with the set apart spirit looked steadily into the heaven and saw the esteem of Elohim and Yahushua standing at the right hand of Elohim and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the son of Adam standing at the right hand of Yahuwah. He said Yahuwah. But in the Greek text, all we see is this one. <laughs> and that's because it's been monked with. Some monks got a hold of it. And th this word T-H-E-O-S is a Greek reference for this deity of the Greeks. That's what they called him. Anyway. Joseph Ratzinger, who's the current Pope Benedict XVI, his Pope prohibited the name, as he understood it, Yahweh, from being spoken or sung, saying it is offensive to some people. Now, that's uh, a, pro a proclamation, or it's actually a new dogma, uh, he made in the sixth Roman month of 2008, and he wants it to be replaced with this word dominus, which is a probably a bad word. Anyway, uh, I put uh, Nancy's picture up here, Nancy Pelosi's picture, because she's following what the Pope says, I'm sure. She's a Catholic. Now, he doesn't like it, so it's, it's offensive to some people to say the name, okay? Crying out with a loud voice, now this is still Stephen, okay, uh, the report of Stephen. This is uh, Luke writing this down for us crying out with a loud voice. This is an entire chamber of elders of Israel crying out, Sanhedrin people. They said, they stopped up their ears and rushed upon him with one mind and they threw him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Shaul. That's who later we know as Paul. Now this term we were talking about earlier, the Greek word 2316 is T-H-E-O-S. It's a Greek pronoun and it's used commonly as a reference to this Z-E-U-S. And it's an obvious substitution. 
Otherwise, they wouldn't have ripped their robes. They, they were ripping robes, shutting their ears up. That means they're putting their hear, hands, hands to their head and screaming because they heard blasphemy, according to their traditions. Because when somebody said the name out loud, they stoned them, you know. Because it just became, a, you know, a policy. Because after the Babylonian, well, during the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians were mocking them and saying that these people are yahoos. And they were using it in a bad way. Because they proclaimed the name. They had the name on them, the Yahudim. And the Babylonians were pagans and they thought, oh no, the name is being put in their mouths. Their mouths are blaspheming. They were using it improperly, true. But they were also not, no, they said the name because they, they kept, but anyway, they said, well, we can't let them know what it is. So they went through saying, don't say it, don't say it, and maybe they'll shut up. So that's how this tradition really started. It started in Babylon, but not saying the name out loud continued for centuries and centuries and centuries, and they were stoning people for it. They don't like the Hebrew flavor of the personal name of our creator in the seminaries either, so they substitute L-O-R-D. The New International Version in the preface says this, in quotes, in regard to the divine name, yod he ua he they put a W in there, but commonly referred to as the tetragrammaton. That's, that means Greek for four letters. Tetra is four, grammaton means letters. The translators adopted the device used in most English versions of rendering that name as L-O-R-D in capital letters to distinguish it from Adonai, another Hebrew word rendered L-O-R-D for which small letters are used. Well, I'm glad they made that distinction, but they just, they just told you that they took the name and, out of the text and just obliterated it. And that's because of tradition. And they say that because it's used in most English versions. So we're freed by truth so that restoration may occur. If we're not going to restore anything, then we're going to continue along the same lines and follow the same blind people that are following other blind people. We're, we're breaking out of the blind herd, and we're not going to be like those people. We're, we're going to get out of the line, that, and we're going to just be, you know, heretics. <laughs> but... Uh, in Jeremiah, or Yermiyahu, in chapter 10, the prophet writes this, Pour out your fury upon the heathen that do not know you, and upon the families that, do, that call not on your name. So if you don't call on his name, he's just said that he wants the fury of Yahuwah poured out on you. So if you're pr pr proclaiming the name, then obviously you're not part of that. But in, in Yael it says, And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. So the name is part of the secret message as well. It's been concealed, and now it's being restored. The name was removed from the lips of the Yahudim. In Yermiyahu 44, it says, Therefore hear the word of Yahuwah, all, you, all of Yehuda who are dwelling in the land of Mitzrayim. See, I have sworn by my great name, declares Yahuwah, my name shall no longer be called upon by the mouth of any man of Yehuda, in all the land of Mitzrayim, saying, as the master Yehuda lives. So he removed it because they had returned to Mitzrayim, I mean, in their practices, you know. Um, so this is not a text that he's saying, don't, don't say it. He's removing it. Now, he has the power to alter our speech. Remember the Tower of Babel. If you turn away from his covenant, then he will remove his name from our lips. And if, again, that's Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 44, verse 26. And look at the surrounding context verses. Don't just pull a verse out and say, look at that, or a phrase. Look at the context, and that's really what it, what it, what it means. Now, speaking the name aloud was considered to be blasphemy. In Matthew 26, 64, 65, Yahushua said to him, you have said it. Besides, I say to you, from now on, no, from now you shall see the son of Adam sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on cl the clouds of the heaven. Now he's talking to the Sanhedrin himself too. Then the high priest tore his garment saying, he has blasphemed. Why, why do we need any more witnesses? See now, you have heard his blasphemy. 
Now, he didn't say this. Somebody's monked with the text. But he said something in that sentence that caused them to believe that he had blasphemed, and that would have been he uttered the name. Now, blasphemy to them was uttering the name. So Pope Benedict would agree with the Sanhedrin because he prohibited the name from being uttered aloud as well. You know, you can't teach with it, you can't sing with it, you can't say it in any public assemblies. Now that's what the Pope said. The authorities arrested the Nazarene everywhere due to their speaking of the name. Shaul explains this in Acts 26. And punishing them often in every synagogue, I compelled them to blaspheme. And being, in other words, he was compelling them to blaspheme by trickery, you know, making them, hey, what, what's going on? You know, you're not serene, aren't you? Yeah, well, you know, all the not serene were in the synagogues, you know, that's where they were. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. It must be called upon. In truth, it's blasphemy to eliminate the name. Acts 4.12 says, And there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we need to be saved. Now, these terms are not terms or names of deliverance. J-E-S-U-S, L-O-R-D, G-O-D, Adonai. These are not words that the prophet Yael said we have to call upon. It's, we have to call upon the name of Yahuwah, and all those that do will be delivered. But he won't let you, or make you even want to, if you don't love his covenant. If you don't love his covenant, it's over. Now repent for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. This is the message. And we're going to be reigned over by a loving king who wants to, us to love him. Not serene or branches or trees restoring the waste. Now the trees, that's an interesting term for us. Um, I want you to notice this uh, text in Yeshayahu 61 again, and also repeated in Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the master Yahuwah is upon me because Yahuwah has anointed me to bring the good news, that's Basar, to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. We're gonna, we've already read this text, but we're going to go a little further this time. And to proclaim release to the captives. Now the captives are the dispersed sheep of Israel. That's where we are. We're in the world right now. We're not rejoined to the land. We won't be rejoined to the land until the end when he returns. Okay? Now, that's what he's talking about. The release of the captives. Uh, we're in captivity. That's what we are. If we're not in the land, then we're in captivity. Even if we go back to the land, we're still in captivity because he did not return us. Now, the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahuwah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim to, pr to comfort all who mourn who appoint unto those and appoint unto those who mourn in Sion to give them ornamentation for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and they shall be called trees of righteousness, a planting of Yahuwah to be adorned. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, raise up the former wastes, and they shall restore the ruined cities, the wastes of many generations. And now he's talking not just physically, but also metaphorically about the Torah being rebuilt in, in his people. Because we're part of that restoration. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called priests of Yahuwah. Servants of our Elohim shall be said of you. You shall consume the strength of the Gentiles and boast in their esteem. Instead of your shame and reproach, they, they rejoice a second time in their portion. Therefore, they take a possession a second time in their land. Everlasting joy is theirs. For I, Yahuwah, love right ruling. I hate robbery for, bur for burnt offering, and I shall give their reward in truth and make an everlasting covenant with them, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge them, and they, th that they are the seed Yahuwah has blessed. The word uh, evangel or evangelist is actually mentioned here uh, in the what they call the New, new Covenant writings, uh, about 102 times. It's actually not a V because the V is new. It comes from the letter uh, Upsilon. It's Uagelion, mistakenly evangel. There's no V. 
V and W are actually derived from the letter Upsilon, or Ua in Hebrew. The uh, Agalos, or messenger, is one who bears a message and brings a report. The Hebrew equivalent of this, Ua Galeon, is Besora, and it means uh, fresh, report. The word origin for gospel is a fusion word. It's uh, actually uh, Old English, and it means the word good plus news or spell or spiel. When you have a spiel, you're speaking, you know. And then um, a statement, a story, a message. Translation of the word, uh, it's a translation, not a transliteration, but a translation of the word in Latin, bona adnunciatio. Itself is a translation of ua and gelion, which is, uh, you know, that's Greek. But the word is basora. In the word, uh, the heathen term, L-O-R-D, it shall be in that day, says Yehuah, that you shall call me husband and shall call me no more, B-A-A-L-I. Now, the Hebrew word for L-O-R-D is B-A-A-L. You can look that up in Webster's. Just look up B-A-A-L. For I will take away the names of the B-A-A-L-S's out of their mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Now, that's Hosea 2. The word origin and history for B-A-A-L is the name of many deities of the Semitic peoples from the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. And it means literally owner, master, lord. Now if it's used as a husband, it's okay, but not to substitute his name with it. The Encyclopedia Americana, 1945 edition, says under the topic G-O-D, that this is a com this is quote, common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. On conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, the term was applied to the supreme being. Yeah, the dragon is definitely involved. Matthew, or Matthew 26, and when Yahushua was in Beth Anya at the house of Shimon the leopard, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of costly perfume and she poured it on his head as she sat at the table. And when his taught ones saw it, they were much displeased, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this perfume could have been sold for much and given to the poor. However, when Yahushua noticed it, he said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work toward me. For you always have the poor with you, but, you do not, but me you do not always have, have always. For in pouring this perfume on my body, she did it for my burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in all the world. What this woman has, been do has done shall be spoken of also to her remembrance. Now, that's something that I feel is a key to recognizing when you hear the true message. If you don't mention this girl then, uh, and what she did, then maybe you aren't listening to the correct message. It's maybe a two-dimensional message. Now, why is she remembered? Because of her broken spirit towards her sin. And we remember, we, met, we read text about Yahuwah and, and looking for people with a broken spirit toward your sins. And her absolute submission to her Redeemer. And one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. He hung around with him a lot. And see a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she, when she knew that Yahushua sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of perfume and abiding at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head and was kissing his feet and anointing them with a perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself inside of his thoughts and said, this one, if he knew, if he were a prophet, would know what, who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Yahushua answered and said to him, Shimon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. A certain creditor had two debtors. The one owed 500 pieces of silver and the other 50. And when they were unable to repay, he forgave them both. Which of them then shall love him more? And Shimon answering said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. And turning to the woman, he said to Shimon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wetted her feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but she has not ceased to kiss my feet since, I came, uh, since the time I came in. 
You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I say to you, her many sins have been forgiven, because she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, he loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were sitting at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your belief has saved you. Go in peace. This is why she was remembered. Her broken spirit toward her sins and her absolute submission to her Redeemer. Um, now, Yahuwah's face either turns towards us or against us. In Psalm 34, the face of Yahuwah is against evildoers to cut off their remembrance from the earth. The righteous cried out and Yahuwah heard and delivered them out of all their distresses. And Yahuwah is near to the brokenhearted and saves those whose spirit is crushed. Now, here's some texts that declare the Besora. Matthew, or Matthew 4, 23. And Yahushua went about all Galil, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the Besora of the reign, and healing every disease and every bodily weakness among the people. And Matthew 24 says, in verse 14, And this Besora of the reign shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to the nation, nations, and then the end shall come. So when the message gets really widespread, the true message, not the two-dimensional message, you know, about just believe, but believe and obey, that's the message. And make disciples, go and teach them everything that I commanded you to obey. That's, uh, that's a sure sign that we're getting close. In Mark 1, and after Yehuchanan was delivered up, Yehusha came to Galil proclaiming the Besorah of the reign of Elohim and saying the time has been filled and the reign of Elohim has come near. Repent and believe the Besorah. And the Besorah has to be proclaimed first to all the nations and then the end will come. But Romans 1 starts off in verse 16 and says, For I am not ashamed of the good news of the Messiah, for it is the power of Elohim for deliverance to everyone who believes, to the Yehudi first, and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of Elohim is revealed. Without the Torah you will never know the righteousness of Elohim. From belief to belief, as it has been written, but the righteous shall live by belief. That's Habakkuk chapter 2. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known of Elohim is manifest among them for Elohim has manifested it to them even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper having been filled with all unrighteousness whoring wickedness greed evil filled with envy murder fighting deceit evil habits whisperers slanderers haters of Elohim insolent proud boasters devisers of evils disobedient to parents without discernment, covenant breakers, unloving, unforgiving, ruthless, who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And that's a religious mindset because they think, well, you believe, you've been saved, so you can't obey. You don't need to obey. He's, he's saved you. That's what they're saying. The evidence of the true message is being proclaimed, is being cited right here in Matthew 26. Truly I say to you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in all the world, what this woman has done shall be spoken of also, to her remembrance. So what specifically is the message that is to be believed, which is to be obeyed too? It's for the bride, that's Israel. Israel is the bride that he married at Sinai. Now, those who are perishing will not receive a love for the truth, therefore they are sent a strong delusion to believe the lie. The truth is the word of Yahuwah, his covenant with his wife. The living water that the Messiah shares with his wife Israel is his covenant. It comes alive in us. Now, in 2 Thessalonians, it said that falsehood is believed by those who are perishing. The coming of the lawless one, the one without the Torah, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive a love for the truth 
that's the Torah, in order for them to be saved. For this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion, a religious delusion, for them to believe the falsehood, in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. But we ought to give thanks to Elohim always for you, brothers, beloved by the Master, because Elohim from the beginning chose you to be saved in set apartness of spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our good news for the obtaining of the esteem of our Master Yahushua Messiah. So then, brothers, stand fast and hold fast to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our letter. So what is truth? Well, his word is truth. John 17, in the priest, high priestly prayer, he said, Set them apart in your truth. Your word is truth. And Psalm 119 says, Your righteousness is righteousness forever. And your Torah is truth. That's verse 142. And it says, if you, if you read uh, Torah, uh, Psalm 119, it says uh, it's forever. You are near, O Yahuwah, and all your commands are truth. That's verse 151. So if you receive a love for the truth, then you must have received the covenant. Now, we talked a little bit about the uh, catechetical school of Alexandria and how they took another, another path. So for almost 2,000 years, or, well, 1,800 years, we've been listening to a two-dimensional message. In Romans 16, it says, Now I call upon you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and stumbling, contrary to the teaching, that's the Torah, which you have learned, and turn away from them. He's talking to Nazarim, obviously. False shepherds have taught division, separating the uh, C-H-U-R-C-H from is Israel. Actually, they claim the term Israel for themselves. It's replacement theology. There is one body, and Gentiles must engraft into it. Okay? and become part of the commonwealth of Israel. If you read, uh, you know, basically Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 13, and Acts 3 and Acts 15. In uh, Yermayahu 50, uh, there's only one body, and, and this is a fulfillment prophecy of uh, in, the days, in those days, and at that time, it's in the last days, declares Yahuwah, the children of Yisrael, that's the lost tribes, shall come, they and the children of Yehuda together. See, right now they're kind of at odds with one another, but they're going to come together, weeping as they come, and seek Yahuwah their Elohim. And they shall ask the way to Sion, their faces toward it. Come and let us join ourselves to Yahuwah in an everlasting covenant, never to be forgotten. Not their covenant, but his. My people have been wandering sheep for literally 2,700 years. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. The mountains are the nations. And they have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Our commission is to carry the message to the nations. And Yahushua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Set Apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. Amen is a, a Hebrew term that actually is just three letters, it, amen, and it means absolutely, you know, affirmation. It's a, it's a word of affirmation. The bride is Israel, not this C-H-U-R-C-H. Uh, -H. That's derived from a pagan term, a pagan deity. The bride at the end of the age is regathered, literally seized at his coming, probably while the, the moon is turned to blood and the sun is darkened. Deuteronomy 30 is a prophecy about the end days, and it shall be when all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall br bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles where Yahuwah your Elohim drives you, and you shall turn back to Yahuwah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children. Then Yahuwah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Elohim has, has scattered you. And if any of you are driven to the farthest parts under the heavens, from there, Yahuwah your Elohim does gather you. And from there, he does take you. 
So the shepherds will feed the scattered people of Israel in the last days. Yirmiyahu 3 says, And I shall give you shepherds according to my heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And uh, Yahushua told Peter, or Kepha, in Yahushua 21, to feed my sheep. For those who will not listen and obey, here's what we hear. Deuteronomy 30, 18 says, I have declared to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you are passing over the yard to enter and possess. I have called the heavens and the earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life, that's Torah, and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore you shall choose life so that you live, both you and your seed, to love Yahuwah your Elohim, to obey his voice and to cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, to dwell in the land which Yahuwah swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Yishak, and to Yaakov, to give them. In Matthew 19, uh, this is a record of a man who came up to Yahushua and said, uh, Good teacher, what shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commandments. Now that's not, uh, I should have put a warning on that page, you know. But we had one at the beginning. Now the, the Torah is light, therefore Yahushua, in, in John chapter 8, it says, therefore Yahushua spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, that's does what I do, shall by no means walk in darkness but possess the light of life. And Proverbs 6, 20 says, My son, watch over your father's command, and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you are walking about, it leads you. When you lie down, it guards you. And when you have woken up, it talks to you. For the command is a lamp, and the Torah a light. A light. And reproofs of discipline, a way of life. That's Psalm 119, 105. Uh, now this, is the, this is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We know the Torah is a light. We know the commandment is a lamp. And if you believe in the light, you're okay. But if you don't, you're, you're going to perish. John 3 says, again, we, we read all this. Now this is, this is what we already covered when he was speaking to Nicodemus. Now we're cleansed by obeying the truth. This is really interesting. Uh, it pops out at you. See, the message is all through Scripture. It says in 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 22, Now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned brotherly love, that's what it's teaching us, love for Yahuwah and love for one another, Love one another fervently with a clean heart, having been begotten from above, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the living word of Elohim, which remains forever. That's what Stephen called the covenant that was given to Israel, the living words. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the esteem of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of Elohim remains forever. And this is the word announced as good news to you. So there he said it. He nailed it right there. It's, if, if you all were not getting it, that's where he actually said what it was. But it's still secretly plant, planted there. I mean, it's just buried in there, see? But it's very clear when your eyes are opened. The message of deliverance begins with a word, a name, a person. He who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse us for himself, a people, his own possession, ardent for good works. In other words, we want to obey. That's Titus 2. Our obedience is the thing that perfects our faith and is evidence that we are being saved. So if we preserve the Torah in our lamp, which is our heart, you know, then we're doing what he wanted us to do, and we're to share that light with the world around us. Because he said, you are the light of the world. And this is a picture of the, uh, an illustration of the prodigal son returning to his father. And uh, that's the lost tribes coming back to the covenant. You know. 
So uh, it took me an hour and a half <laughs> to get through. There were about 80 slides there.